Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation from Okuma. I'm David Lyle, Associate Editor with Modern Machine Shop. In today's environment, manufacturers are being challenged at every turn to deliver products faster, better, and more competitively than their industry counterparts. While working harder can deliver some results, working smarter more often provides the needed competitive edge. By integrating the right machining and automation technologies, manufacturers can drastically increase both production levels and revenues. Today, uh, we have an agenda here for our webinar. We're gonna consider how to bring automation to your shop, bulletproofing your process for automation, insights on work holding and enhancements in robotics. Our presenters today are Wade Anderson. Wade joined Okuma America Corporation in 2005 as an applications engineer and moved from there to inside sales, sales engineer, and regional manager. He was most recently promoted to product specialist sales manager and tech centers manager. His diverse background enables him to help Okuma's distributors and end users go beyond their manufacturing challenges. John Dewey uh, has problem solving expertise within the robotics industry that showcases his deep knowledge of applying the latest technologies to enhance customers' profits, quality control, and output. I wanna remind everybody that if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question pane on the right side of your screen, and we'll do our best to get to all of them at the end of the webinar. Also, keep in mind that this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website, mmsonline.com. So for now, just sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation, which begins now. And with that, I hand this off to Wade and John. All right, thank you. Welcome to the presentation. And uh, John, I really appreciate you joining me. Uh, normally, John and I would be sitting in the same room together, but uh, the way things worked uh, with everything going on, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. And John, where are you at? I'm sitting in Rochester Hills, uh, Michigan right now. And thank you very much for the introduction, David. So you got to love the, the use of technology. We're, we're a long ways apart being able to uh, communicate together. So today, a, a quick rundown of the topics that we're going to go through. We're going to start off talking about just industry pressures. What do we see um, typically in the field? Where are some growth opportunities uh, that we can uh, target and extrapolate on? And then let's go through types of automation. What type of automation do we typically see from an OEM provider versus what are application driven um, custom type applications for specific customer needs. Considerations for automation. To me, this is really the building blocks for people who have never automated and they want to look at getting into automation. What are the steps that they need to be considering to do that? And then we'll go through a couple of different uh, type of examples. So to kick off some of the common pressures, uh, John, I know you spend a lot of time in the field. I do as well. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the I guess the common threads is you're no longer just competing with the job shop next door. A lot of the projects that people are competing on are national uh, competition or global competition where you're competing with people uh, in, in different parts of the globe. There's continuous price pressure on uh, reducing prices, shortage of labor. I think that goes even, uh, you don't even have to talk too much on that. Everybody knows the, the pain associated with that. And even globalization currencies and not just finding labor, but finding the right skill sets um, needed. So at the end of the day, a lot of the common pressures that we see is how do we do less with more? Uh, I just said that backwards. How do we do more with less? Um, <laughs> getting tongue tied already, John. So from a global competition standpoint, there's four primary bullet points that I always look at that everybody has to contend with globally and that's people tooling and equipment materials and then financial resources every manufacturing company has those same uh, four common bullet points that you have to contend with your real area to differentiate yourself lies in your process um, I, I put a part down here just to kind of have as a talking point but any given part that you look at I could line up a part and tie five customers or five application engineers together and say, how do you manufacture that part? And I can come up with five different solutions for it. So your process and the way that you can be the most efficient is what really determines how competitive you can be in a global standpoint. You know, Wade brings up some very good points. You know, people are our biggest asset. 
and leveraging what people have is really what's going to make automation and deployment thereof successful. But we look at some key numbers in the industry that we're experiencing today. And within the next five to 10 years, we're expecting about a three and a half million uh, person gap into where uh, we're going to be needed to fill job man or manufacturing jobs today. Today, that number is two and a half million. It's a common number. People have probably heard it in these expectations. But one of the things that we're really fighting also is the demographic of our aging workforce. We're losing on average 10,000 people a day to retirement. And that really heavily affects the small to medium sized job shop that is watching 35, 40 year employees walk out the door and not being able to find that skill set readily available. And when you really think about when there's over 23,000 companies that are cataloged, uh, cataloged or categorized as a job shop or a, a small to medium sized shop, that is a lot of people and a lot of manufacturing processes that are being affected by the aging demographic and the shortage of work people. And when you look at the whole environment from a CNC perspective, there's over probably closer to a million um, machine tools installed in the North American market. And the disappointing fact is only 5% of those machine tools have a robot tending them. And from the people that I talk to on a regular basis, I mean, you always ask, you know, how is your spindle utilization? Can we, what can a robot do to help you? And Wade, I believe you guys have, have some data on this. Sure. So uh, about two years ago, we did a survey where we go, uh, we surveyed tier one OEMs all the way down to privately held and operated uh, manufacturing companies. So everything ranging from small to large uh, machine shops to see what is your truly measured spindle utilization. The results of that survey is 34%. So basically out of roughly 8,000 hours that's available for a machine to run, average machines are typically run about 3,000 hours throughout the course of the year. So that's that's where the low hanging fruit is from an efficiency standpoint. Um, I think a lot of times people feel, you know, they get that feeling. I feel like I'm doing a lot better than that. But once you actually start measuring and putting metrics in place, you find out where where the truth actually lies. and that's where you can really target how do we make our manufacturing process more efficient. You know, so that, that number 34%, it was rather shocking because most people, when you talk to them, you know, they're going to think that their spindle utilization is in the high 70s, low 80s, maybe without really doing any investigation. That's scary. Um, a part yeah. of that can be attributed to a talent shortage, why their spindles aren't running. So we, we tabbed and work with the A3 to find out what are people doing to overcome these talent shortages. Um, and a lot of people are focusing on upskilling and training their existing workforce. Um, others are looking to do things like recruiting from the outside. And the number that really scares me is the bottom number. 11% of the people in the manufacturing environment are doing nothing about the job shortage. I, I find that a recipe for failure, but uh, again, 11% of the people are deciding not to do anything to address the job shortage, the, the, the skills gap, or even upskilling their people, which is, in my opinion, very, very scary. Yeah, John, that was the one thing that really stood out to me when you showed me this slide. When I looked at it, you know, I think the top three bars to me kind of seem somewhat uh, common sense, right? That's what I think everybody feels like that they're doing. They're working towards improving the talent that they've got. How do they retain their talent? How do they find new talent reaching out, recruiting people? But mm -hmm. to, to think about that, there's a, a fairly large group that's saying, hey, we understand that we've got a problem. We've got pain points. And what are we going to do about it? And to say nothing, that's that's a scary, uh, scary sight to me. You know, so we, we kind of broke out and looked at where a lot of these companies are facing um, in the industry that are facing these challenges. So roughly the quarter million small to medium sized shop, you know, a majority of these are in the metal forming and machine tool space where you're loading and unloading a machine tool, a very large percentage of that. So when we were looking at this, we started to find out that, you know, let's focus on this machine tool area because they're the area and they're the people that are going to really be suffering the most from a job shortage. To have a guy that's sitting there loading a lathe or loading a, a piece of work holding in a machine tool day after day, hour after hour, it gets redundant, it gets boring, it's not challenging, and mistakes happen when people get bored and unchallenged. So a lot of people are starting to consider automation for the first time, and we wanna make sure that when you do that, we help you optimize your investment in automation. Right, and I think that's the really the target audience that we're speaking to today. 
the the large tier one manufacturing companies or your automated uh, automotive guys, you know, they can set up a manufacturing plant anywhere in the world. They've they've done automation for so long. They can set things up and they can really control their cost of manufacturing no matter where they're deployed throughout the globe. What we really need to focus on for the North American market is who are the small to medium sized job shops or, or machine shops that have not dipped their toe in that automation field. And, and how do we how do we get them moving towards uh, that scenario and being more competitive in the marketplace? So some of the things that I want to talk to as we move into kind of this next section is the types of automation that we commonly see on machine tools. So to start with, from an OEM perspective, um, one of the ones that's been around for a long, long time are gantry loaders. So Okuma and a lot of uh, a lot of your top uh, machine tool builders, we all have some type of a gantry loading system. So we have our uh, twin spindle forward facing lays uh, that have been run for years with high speed gantries. And these are for fast, high volume production um, where your load time needs to be in seconds uh, to be able to, to maximize your efficiency on how you run. But we also do this across the board on a multiple uh, turning platforms and mills for that matter. So that's where you would have a gantry going across the top of the machine and basically a moon roof at the top of the machine. So you're not opening the entire door. You just have a small moon roof that opens to let the gantry arm get in and out. So again, typically targeted for high volume, fast running production. Then when we get into mills, the, the primary one is uh, kind of our go-to is pallet pools. So we go from uh, two APC on a horizontal machining center or going from a standalone five axis machine to a two APC five axis machine we can easily retrofit and add pallet pools to these systems to take customers from two, six, 10, 12 different pallets. Um, we can have single uh, level pallets or dual level pallets, depending on what the, the process is that the customer is going for. So pallet pools have been around a long time. We do a lot in that market space, but then there's the supplier type automation. And one of the easiest ones that, a lot of people don't even think about from an automation standpoint, but that's bar feeders, right? That's kind of the entryway, your gateway to automation for a lot of machine shops. Bar feeders have been around for a long time. And the question I would have is, are we using them as efficiently as we can? Are we maximizing the, the diameter of the spindle and the bar capability to be able to get the widest range of parts out of one common material platform? Many times I, I can be more cost effective by making smaller diameter parts out of larger diameter material because I can ch save on change over time. And anytime that spindle is not cutting, you're losing money on that piece of equipment. So maximizing your, your bar feeder is uh, strategically important from an automation standpoint. And then from mill standpoint, we also get into our FMS systems. So uh, these are flexible manufacturing systems. And these would be, you know, typically horizontals was always kind of the go-to, but anymore we're seeing more and more with vertical machining centers as well as five axis machines going onto FMS systems. And these sometimes can be loaded with an elevator type system where you have an elevator going in, picking a pallet off the shelf, placing it onto the APC of the machine tool. Or uh, more recently, we're seeing a lot more involvement with robo FMS systems where we have a, a robot on a rail that would be running up and down the rail to load five axis machine pallets and things of that nature. So a lot of the application driven and the one off and the, the actually the, the specific designed automation, that's a very common platform as well. And when you put a robot in front of a machine tool, it also gives you the opportunity to open that, that machine tool up and the, the process for the robot to do more, whether it's inspection. And if you note in the picture, and um, we may have a picture later on in the, this presentation, but if you look in the picture, that robot is going to be taking parts to a CMM. It's going to be palletizing. It's going to be depalletizing. It's going to be taking finished parts and unfinished parts. It's doing all of the functions of an operator without any human intervention. Yep. You know, we also have partners such as Gossiger Automation that develop standard packages for the machine tool. The one we're looking at here is a carousel system where the robot can pick from the carousel, load the spindle, unload the spindle, put the finished parts back in the spot. In the same time, in conjunction with that, the operator's on the other side of the screen, potentially loading other parts, waiting for this table to index. He then takes the, old, the, the finished parts off the road, 
off the table. He comes back in 30 minutes, does the same thing again, and the process continues. There are other packages available that Wade will get into um, later on in the discussion, but a standard package could also be a very viable solution to deploy automation in a quick fashion. Yeah, that's definitely a growing area of the market from a robotic standpoint. So John, I think you've got a video that you're gonna show. Yeah, it's a quick little <clears throat> video about the cost of, the minimum wage cost and how that is going to affect the manufacturing environment. So as the minimum, raise, the minimum wage gets raised, this is gonna really affect the small to medium job shop and those owners who typically pay their people 10 to $15 an hour to do some of these simple machining tasks. So this video kind of operates and shows the basic costing and the figures of why once you hit $15 an hour, it's much more advantageous to have a person doing something else other than tending a machine. I think many people are shocked when they find out that the burden rate of a $15 an hour job on a three shift operation is almost $150,000 a year. That's important. Yeah, when I say $150,000, I'm including the tax and benefits. Yeah. That fully burdened rate is very important when you're trying to do the justification and ROI expenditures. So the costing on, the, on these, um, this is not a FANUC video, this is something that I had pulled off the internet, but the costing and the cost of operating a robot, we can actually can control those costs. And these numbers are fairly accurate, but when you, depending on the robot you use and the size, obviously it's a different straw, but on average, these costing figures are quite accurate. And that, that's fairly accurate in terms of consumption, maintenance, and uh, electrical draw, and how much it costs to operate a robot. So you can see that we're going to send this back to Wade's presentation here, I believe. There we go. So when people are deploying automation for the first time, one of the things that people and companies experience is a culture shock. And part of that culture is, is that they're intimidated or afraid of robots. They think the robot is gonna take their job and they don't look at it as a tool to augment their current performance or as a tool that can make them do their job better, um, which is basically the same way to say what I just said. But we have statistics and we prove, and we've been proven through company or organizations like A3 have helped generate this data, that for every robot installed in the environment in the ecosystem, we create about four to five jobs. And those jobs can be anywhere from logistics to maintenance to programming, to engineering, to project management, to pretty much anything that's going to do with the automation project in whole, robots create this ecosystem. So the fear that robots take jobs was nothing but a marketing ploy by the uh, UAW and companies like that or organizations like that back in the 80s that were threatened um, by the robot. Today, the UAW embraces robots and they understand that it keeps their workforce safe. We are not putting people in the dirty, dangerous, mundane, repetitive jobs. We're leaving that for the robot. We're creating those jobs elsewhere and we're giving people the opportunity to get a higher rewarding job, basically. Allows you to redeploy your uh, talent assets to more higher value add for the person and the company itself. So. Correct. I always like to look at as we're talking about automation, uh, basically in terms of building blocks or, you know, putting the game plan together for success. So a lot of times people, when we talk about automation, you think about the machine tool and you think about the robot and can you get the two to communicate and things of that nature. That's the easy part. The, the part that you really got to spend time on and get um, a really good plan up front is your upfront process itself because automation is really only executing the plan that you developed early on. So if you don't have control of all your variables up front, the automation component won't be successful. So, you know, John, I'm a, I'm a kid of the eighties, right? I grew up in the eighties watching a team and this, this line always stuck in my head when Hannibal would always say, I love it when a plan comes together. 
So you, you didn't get the Barack video and say like, I pity the fool who doesn't automate. <laughs> that's that's going to be a meme you're going to have to come up with. <laughs> so a couple of considerations for automation. Uh, these are kind of the, my top bullet points that I always like to look at anytime I'm, I'm talking about a, a project that even if it starts without automation, but we know somewhere in the future, we're going to look at incorporating automation. Here's some of the, the components that I always want to look at. And it really starts in my mind with reliable machines, because if you can have the best idea for a cutting process, but at the end of the day, if the equipment that you're using isn't reliable, you're not going to be successful and get the utilization rates that you need to see. So make sure regardless of the machines that you're using, make sure you've got reliable equipment and that you've got a maintenance program uh, to maintain and keep your machines reliable and not have unexpected downtime from unexpected failures. The strategy for production, that's a that's a huge talking point that we got to work through and understand what's your strategy for producing parts. Um, again, five people can make the same part five different ways. So what's important for your manufacturing process? What are you doing currently right now? And then where are you trying to take the company five, 10 years down the road? And let's make sure we put a process in place that doesn't handicap you from getting there fixtures, making sure that they're safe and repeatable, um, utilizing technology from a pressure sensing standpoint, things of that nature. Um, but what are what's the tolerances that you're trying to hold on your parts for your manufacturing environment? And then are your fixtures repeatable enough to do that? Um, there's many times I have these kind of conversations and ask customers, what's the gauge R&R &R on the fixture you're using? And uh, I've said this recently in a recent uh, presentation, you get a deer and headlight look where um, they, you realize they've never checked. They've never actually measured their R&R &R on their fixtures that they're utilizing. So things like that's an important step. The cutting process, making sure one predictable, uh, that, that's kind of a, a common sense thing, but having redundant tools. You want to have redundant tools in any kind of an automation process so that if you have uh, an unexpected chip wear, uh, something that happened to your cutting tool, you don't shut down the cycle in the middle of the night, you can call up a redundant tool, keep producing parts until you get somebody on site the next day. Cutting fluids, making sure you've got uh, a controlled feedback loop on what's taking place in the process itself. Quality, making sure you've got inspections in place. Once you implement automation, you're driving to increase your production, your productivity. So we can make a lot of parts. It's up to you and the process. Are those parts good parts? Or are you making a lot of bad parts? So that's all got to be uh, considered in the process itself. Scheduling and tracking of the workflow and then communication. I, I touched on it earlier, but having a closed loop communication process so that you know what's taking place. You can visualize what's happening on your shop floor when you're not there or your operators or, or setup people are not there on, on site. So. Let me start by talking about the strategy of manufacturing. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of multi-axis machines, doing five-axis machining, um, combining the multiple processes into one machine. However, there's times where you're going to be more productive doing what I'll call a more conventional process, going back to multiple machines, Op 10 through Op 20, 30, 40, whatever the case may be. So what does that look like for your manufacturing flow depends, again, on your specific needs. Um, but there's some simple math that can be done to look at where's your break even point from a manufacturing process. Again, this isn't a, a one size fit all answer for everybody, but it's a piece of the puzzle, right? It's one way to look at things to say, OK, which way is going to be better for me? So in this given scenario, given these tack times and setup times, what I'm looking at is the setup time difference over runtime difference. And then that is going to equal where my break even point is on parts. So for this given scenario, anything below 40 parts, if I'm doing production runs of less than 40 parts, basically, I'm going to be faster doing those on a multifunction machine because I can reduce setup time primarily is, is the key driving factor. However, if I'm running hundreds or thousands of parts, okay, there might be an argument made to say, hey, we need to go away from that multifunction process and break it back down to individual, more of a conventional manufacturing process. Well, that is going to change my outlook on how I'm going to automate that system. So that's why that's one of the first steps that I want to look at is what's your strategy for manufacturing parts 
Now let's look at what's the, the right type of automation going into it. John, do you want to touch a little bit on, um, well, let me let me talk briefly on fixtures and zero point uh, systems. Again, this is more about reducing uh, setup time, reducing your changeover time. You want commonality in your workflow process. So by utilizing a, a zero point type system, um, this is an example from Jurgens. Uh, we, we work a lot of partner companies, Shunk, uh, Big Kaiser, uh, just to name a few. And utilizing a base plate system that stays on the machine for your zero point receiver and then your base plate that your fixture is mounted to, that allows me to have commonality, not only from the work standpoint on the machine interface, but also from the robotic standpoint. You know, and one of the more important features of these zero point clamping systems, and for those online who may know me or if uh, anyone's interested, I, I did spend a good, a good majority of my career at Shunk. Um, and work holding and fixturing was part of one of the things that we did at Shunk for many years in, in conjunction and partnership with Akuma. But the, this, this one, this, um, this is an actual zero point clamping system um, from Big Kaiser. And the, the, the advantage of this is when you talk about a commonality of a pick point from a robot, when you can eliminate the part touching details from a gripper that have to touch a part touching detail to put it into another vice, which encompasses another part touching detail, all of that is engineering and cumbersome. So these zero point clamping systems from the robot perspective, give a common place to grip, a common grip point. And then what you do is you have all the plates, whether it's a vice, a plate, a group of vices, or even these knobs that you see um, actually on the part itself. Uh, there's many applications where the robot will put a part in an op 10 and the part will be transferred using that commonality and that grip, one common grip point that is consistent from station to station, op to op, or plate to plate, vice to vice. These systems are very cost effective and they're very versatile. So it's a great way to eliminate waste out of the, the uh, manufacturing process itself. So this is just an overall picture. This is Big Kaiser's uh, version of one of their zero point base plate systems. So you can kind of see the whole fixture come together. So at the very bottom, the picture on the left, the very bottom, that would be your base plate that would stay in the machine. Um, or would only be changed out based on uh, change over time for setup uh, for a new part, things of that nature. But provided your parts will fit on a plate that will adapt to that base plate, then your base plate receiver is that top aluminum piece. And then your part is clamped on top of it uh, in various different ways. But then you can see your end of arm effector that's got the number five on it. So it'd be part number five going into the system. That's the part that the robot end of arm tooling is interfacing with to pick that pallet up, get it in and out of the machine. So this is a way that you can kind of see it all come together. And the beauty of that is by utilizing those base plates, my top tooling, my fixtures or how I'm clamping the part can change from part to part to part. So in this rack on the left, I've got four in, in this case, it's four pretty similar parts, but there's nothing saying I can't couldn't have four completely different parts with zero change over time from the robot or loading into the machine side of it because I'm picking up a common point on the, the plate itself. Another thing I'll touch to, um, this is a, a fixture from North, uh, North Heartland Tool. They do a great job of integrating self-contained hydraulics. So I can utilize through pallet air or um, overhead hydraulics on a horizontal, things like that to actuate fixtures or the base plate system. But if I've got multiple types of part that require different types of clamping, I can have manual clamping or I can have integrated hydraulic clamping that doesn't need additional support from a hydraulic uh, perspective. So these are really great self-contained hydraulic fixtures um, that allows you again to put that end of arm detail on the side of the pallet and allow that robot to get that pallet in and out of the machine and let all the work of setting the parts up be done outside of the spindle area. So again, you're keeping that spindle operating at all times. Um, so this is an example of a progressive fixture where you're doing an op 10 on the left, you're flipping the part over doing an op 20 on the other side. So every time that part goes in and out of the machine or that pallet goes in and out of the machine, you're getting one complete part off of the system. So again, getting very creative with the way that you work hold uh, components. A very important aspect though, when you're talking about automating parts is making sure the part is seated correctly. 
So one way of doing that is utilizing air seating confirmation so that when the part makes contact or your fixture, uh, your base plate can have air seating confirmation built into it. So when that makes contact, your pressure is driving up and letting the control know that, yeah, hey, I'm, I'm here. I've got the part where it needs to be. But let's say for an example, a piece of foreign debris gets in there or uh, something happens and a part gets misloaded and it's, it's not seating properly. Well, then that, that air uh, sensor is not shut off. Therefore, the air is blowing out into the environment and your pressure is not being made. That can flag the system to say, hey, wait a minute, I've got a problem here. We need to send this part out, bring a different part in or, or a different piece of work holding in, keep production going while we flag an operator to come take a look at this and see what's going on. So this is an example of a zero point type chuck. And you can see I've circled in red where the airports are, where when that is seated correctly, we're making contact with that face and letting the machine know that, yeah, we've got everything held properly and we've got confirmation that the process is correct. So another detail is charging systems. So if you've got big hydraulic systems, there's a couple of ways to go about it. Um, you know, I showed the self-contained system, but if you're using fixtures that need to be charged, we can do that through having uh, rotary unions built into the machine, um, either going through pallet or going overhead. Or we can also, it takes a typically an end of arm change from the end effector, but you can utilize the robot to couple to that fixture and charge the system. But you want to have details built into your work holding to let you know before you start cutting on the part that you've got pressure the way that you the, the way it's supposed to be. So if you're charging work holding, whether it's a self-contained hydraulic piece or you're charging a, a integrated hydraulic fixture outside the environment and it's going into a racking system that the robot's going to be grabbing or an FMS, FMS system is going to be grabbing, you need some kind of in, indicator that's allowing some handshake to the control. If that pallet was sitting there for a week before it goes into the machine, it starts cutting. You need some kind of signal saying, yes, I've got pressure. So there's ways to do that through the control by having gauges that communicate to the control as it's going into the machine that flags that says, yep, I've got pressure or no, I don't. Or you can have details built into the fixture where you have uh, pins, for an example, that come out under a given amount of pressure that part of your probing routine can go in and do a quick fail safe check to know that, yep, the, the detail is out where it's supposed to be. So I know I've got pressure. Part retention. So there's multiple ways to get parts in and out of the machine when you're using automation. One is to, to have the parts set up outside the machine and you're moving the entire fixture in. Another way is to allow the fixture to stay in the machine <clears throat> and you've got the robot that is actually placing parts on the fixture. When that's being done, something to look at is utilizing spring retention so that you, if you have multiple parts, one of the beauties of, of horizontals and other machines is to stack up multiple parts on one work holding device. So if we bring a part in and we set it in the locating fixture, you want to have spring retention that holds that in place while the uh, robot goes and grabs the second part before the hydraulics are initiated. So spring uh, loaded devices and retention are ways to make that very friendly from an automation standpoint. And then chip control is a huge component of um, any type of automation. If you can't control all the variables, you can't have a successfully automated process Chip control is one of those that is uh, very important, especially when you get loading parts in and out of fixtures. You want to make sure that you've got details built into your fixture to allow for air blow or coolant blast to make sure all your details are clean before the robot is presenting new parts into that, that area. So the next area I'm going to talk about is redundant tools. Um, from a lathe perspective, there's you know a couple of ways to look at it depending on the type of parts you're doing. Um, there, there's examples of certain automated cells where you're only actually using one tool in the cut. Well, in that case, a single turret machine can give you, on average, say 12 cutting stations. So if you're only using one, one tool in the cut, you've got one tool and then you've got 11 redundants that you can call up. When we look at our, what we call our LU machine, but twin turret machines, this is where you've got an upper and a lower turret. 
from a cutting process, that gives you some advantages to be able to pinch turn shafts and things of that nature. But it also, from an automation standpoint, gives you more slots to have additional redundant tools. And then you can take that to the extreme, depending on your part family and go to a three turret machine. So for us, that's called an LT model. And we can also have Y axis across the board on all those machines. So on a, a typical machine without Y axis, your tool is on center line. Well, if I add Y axis, now I can put two tools in that spot and I can lift my Y up and down to be able to uh, get adjacent tools. So if your part geometry allows it, you can get real creative utilizing Y axis to get multiple tools in that one tool slot. Again, loading up some flexibility. Multifunction machines, one of the great things about that is the ATC and being able to have a, a library of tools at your disposal to be able to pick and choose from and target parts uh, specifically for that automated cell that falls in line with your catalog of tools that's predefined in that ATC. And the same talking point really goes into effect on machining centers. The, the bigger we can uh, specify tool magazines, um, you know, there's trade-offs to everything. We can take a horizontal machining center that's got a disc ATC. That's usually a 48 or a 64 uh, ATC. That's the fastest tool changer we've got. So if high volume production is super important, that's one aspect to look at. However, if you're gonna deploy that machine into uh, a robo FMS system or something of that nature, then we might wanna look at a matrix magazine or even a tool hive where you've got additional tools that you can have redundant tools built into the system that you're pulling from and dropping off into the machine to have that, again, a, a bigger catalog of tools from a redundant standpoint to pull from. Industry 4.0, IIoT, depending on how you want to, uh, you know, talk about it. Communication is a huge uh, component of automation. And again, I always talk to controlling all the variables. And one aspect of that is understanding what's going on in the machine and other peripheral devices. One way that we do that is through what we call a Kuma monitoring system. I know other builders have different ways of doing this but we tie in sensors to all, literally anything that you can think about that you need to have information being shared on. We have ways to tie sensors to that, to be able to get that communication, um, to see what's going on in that process when people aren't physically there. So coolant flow, coolant pressure, that's been monitored for years. Something that we're seeing um, an uptick on is the coolant concentration though. And especially with the adoption of some of the full synthetic coolants where You've got to be really critical on your uh, concentration levels uh, from a lubricity standpoint, things like that. Well, we can monitor that live in, in the cutting process at all times and be able to communicate to maintenance personnel or things like that when something needs addressed. And that goes across the board. You know, some low hanging fruit um, is way lube oil, for an example. The last thing you want to do is put a great cutting process together, an automation process together and you implement it and you're running parts and at three o'clock in the morning with nobody there, you wind up running out of whaley boil and stalling out uh, the cutting process. There's things like that, that we can avoid that through uh, monitoring and having that as part of your closed loop communication process. So part inspection, you know, another huge consideration I uh, touched on earlier, whenever you automate, your goal is to make a lot of parts without people involved. We can make a lot of really good parts or we can make a lot of really bad parts, depending on how your process is set up. So there needs to be in process inspection, whether it's in the machine or even if you're doing um, third party, um, or, you know, bore gauges, laser gauges, you know, other ways of measuring parts, shop for CMMs. You got to make sure that quality inspection process is inherent to that manufacturing flow. And something I would highly uh, encourage people to consider is Karen Engineering's AutoComp. Again, that takes the, the manual intervention out of the cutting process. Uh, Karen's AutoComp, you set up work and process boundaries that you want to maintain within that manufacturing process. And as the, the day goes on, you get uh, heat, you know, in the flow or you get uh, a little bit of wearing on your inserts and you need to chase a few offsets, AutoComp will communicate automatically between whatever inspection gauge that you're using and the control itself to automatically adjust those offsets. 
or if it's picking up on a trend where it's going outside the process, it can stop, call up a redundant tool and go back into the cut, or it gets to a point that you can, you can have it flag the operator and say, wait a minute, something's not right. We keep making offsets that are bigger than what we would like. We need somebody to come in and take a look at it and be able to control what your quality output looks like. So John, you know, uh, connectivity is such a huge talking point in today's world. Um, Akuma, we've got our Akuma Smart Factory, our, our Akuma Connect plan, where we're monitoring machines. Um, I know, uh, Fanic, you guys have your own monitoring system as well. I think most uh, builders or most OEMs have some sort of a, a monitoring system. That is a way to have eyes on target. And that's the most important thing to me from being able to monitor what's taking place in a production environment when you're not physically there. And to be able to see where where is your maintenance approaching? Um, what good is it to automate a system only to have unexpected maintenance shut you down in the middle of the night? From a production manufacturing uh, engineering standpoint, I wanna make sure that I'm getting my maintenance scheduled in so I don't have unexpected downtime. I need to schedule that so I know I'm getting the most out of my manufacturing process. So just some of the things that, that we look at, we can look at history, we can look at alarms, we can see what our runtime is, see what our efficiency is, we can track alarms and start trending. Why is it every afternoon at three o'clock, you know, this alarm D pops up? Once you start trending that, then that's how you can uh, refine your process over time and get better visual, visual, visualization of your entire manufacturing process. So John, I've been talking a lot. Let me turn this over to you a little bit and let's get uh, a little more granular on some specific types of automation. You know, one thing that's beautiful about when you work with companies like Fanuc and Akuma is we have the right machine for the right application. We're not trying to force fit any of our products into your factory or into your process that aren't fit specifically for that application. So from the FANUC robot perspective, we have a library of products. In fact, we have over 220 different variants of robots. But in the machine tending world, typically these are the robots you're going to see. Our LR Mate, M10, 20, R1000, R2000, and the M900 is one as a machine that'll do up to 700 kilograms. FANUC has larger machines, but in the machine tool world, this is what you're gonna see. The picture you see on the lower right is a picture of our new CRX. That is a new, new offering from FANUC in the collaborative space, which I think will really help the first time automation user help deploy automation at, at, at a greater pace. But for today's argument, what we're talking about today is deploying automation in a connected smart manufacturing environment to one, as Wade just showed on the previous, get a view of your entire manufacturing floor using the right products with the right equipment. Connected smart manufacturing will be what we use to drive our decisions in the, the manufacturing of tomorrow. So in some of the partner applications we have, this one is the AWR from uh, Gossiger. The picture on the left is their VBX, <clears throat> excuse me, the VBX 160 and the, and the AWR. They have two offerings basically. Um, these are ready to deploy automation that can sit right in front of your Akuma machine and start tending parts immediately. So one of the key talking points I like to touch on on this is so many times in the years past, I would talk to customers and they would say, I don't do enough production to justify automating it. Well, with the AWR uh, solutions, literally you can automate a batch of one. So uh, th this really opens up the world of having your machine come with an operator, basically. So this gives uh, a couple of different views of, uh, again, the automation within reach. Uh, this is called the load and go. So the one on the upper left, that's a drawer system. So the robot would actually open the drawer and get uh, raw material to go into the machine and take finished goods out, put it on the drawer. And outside the cell, the operator can open up uh, adjacent drawers to unload finished goods or load up raw material and keep the cell running. So, you know, every couple of hours or whatever, depending on what your needs are, you have an operator come by, offload finished goods, put in new material. 
And the one on the lower uh, right, that is a rotary system. So on the robot side, that's where the, the robot's picking and placing uh, parts as needed. But then on the outside of the cell, the operator again is offloading finished goods, loading up raw material, and then the robot will index that table and the operator can offload finished parts, uh, you know, once a shift or whatever the case may be. So one of the things that I really want to point to, John, is just how simple programming has gotten on systems like this. In um, fact, this is, this is one of the advantages that the AWR system truly offers the customer. Um, a lot of people you'll say, when, especially the first time users of automation, always complain, you know, I don't understand robot programming. How do I interface it with the machine tool? Yeah. Gossiger has addressed all of these upfront concerns. And Wade's going to go through a couple of slides here to show you how truly user friendly this type of automation truly is. So I apologize uh, for uh, AWR if you guys happen to be watching this. Um, these are not professional grade photos. This is literally <laughs> photos of me on the unit that we had on my floor here at Partners and Think stepping through creating a part program and I just snapped it with my cell phone. Um, so I'm not a hand model by any means, but um, you know, step one is you go to the setup button, you tell it what type of material, what does the part look like? Is it a prismatic part? Is it round bar stock? What's the diameter on it? Very simple to define. Step three is you tell it, and in this case, we were loading a lathe. So it's going to automatically show you pictures of the chuck. Are you loading the main spindle or are you loading the sub spindle? If you were uh, loading a mill, for an example, it would have a, a picture of the table, for an example. Um, but again, very uh, just intuitive. You just say, yeah, I'm going to load this part into the main spindle. How am I grabbing the part? Am I grabbing the OD or am I grabbing it from the ID? I'm going to grab it from the OD. Okay, now when I unload it, step number five, what am I unloading from? Am I unloading from the main spindle or am I unloading it from the sub spindle? You define that. What is your gripper location on that one? Are you unloading? Are you grabbing the ID or are you grabbing it from the OD again? You define, are you handling two parts at one time or is this a single part application? Then we go to the home button. We tell it the drawers that we want to utilize. You select the drawers. And then you hit the play button and you are in process. It, it is amazingly simple how they have dialed this process in. When they install this system, literally the, the one, the last one we, we deployed, they, they came in, uncrated it from the time they got it off the shipping receiving dock, uncrated it, put it to the machine, plugged in the interface. They teach it the center line of the, the chuck or the table of the, the pallet. And then from that point on, Within four hours, we had this system in production. It's it's incredible how quick and easy this is. I can't stress that enough. And that's the real key to these pre-engineered kitted processes. So um, to take yeah, that- Actually, before you, before you get to the slide, just to add one little point on, on the AWR, um, if you remember the little uh, chalkboard video where they were talking about the burden rate of an employee being, or the robot being about $170,000 a year, a system like that, a, is nowhere near that cost. Um, the, the the pricing in that little chalkboard video, you could almost get two of these types of systems. So for the purpose of demonstration, it was a great demonstration, but the reality, when you put the rubber to the road, you can come up with solutions that are actually more cost effective. I didn't think we would need to demonstrate that, but because the cost savings are already ridiculous, going within, with a, with a pre-canned or pre-engineered solution can also save you more money because the interface, the programming and the tooling have already been addressed by the supplier. Yep. So, so yeah, I'm John, going to go on, I apologize. Well, for let me, that. I just want to apologize to a couple of people. I've got a video of this cell that I was hoping to be able to go through. And as Murphy's Law would have it, I'm having some technical difficulties on my end and I can't get the video to play. So I've hid that slide, John. So let's just talk to kind of what we're looking at in this cell. So this is a cell that was doing pinion manufacturing. And you know some of the things that I think is very interesting when I first look at, at this cell layout is one, we're utilizing two forms of automation. One, you've got the obvious one being the, the FANUC robot in the center, but we also have a bar feeder that is feeding material. So all the raw material being fed into the cell 
is coming through a bar feeder. So instead of a robot picking placing parts, we're bar feeding it in and the robot is unloading the machine. But and the thing that's interesting, at the back end, the robot is palletizing, inspecting, yes. And then also, uh, I believe it's also doing a QC through the CMM. That's right. right? So yeah, that one. There's a shop floor CMM incorporated into this. So the robot is literally doing everything that you would think about from a manual intervention standpoint, what an operator would do. Uh, these are fairly fast running parts. So an operator would reach in, unload the part, inspect it, um, it do quality confirmations and checks deburr it, uh, there could be serializing involved and yeah. then palletizing it and, and sending it out. And the beauty of this is you're taking all that repetitive type work and you're letting the robot do that. And it's it also increased the quality going out to the customer because before parts were being inspected, you know, uh, once every 10, once every 20 parts, whatever the case may be, or based on changeovers with this cell, they decided, hey, let's just go to a 100% inspection. So because the shop floor CMM, everything is built in there and it's a robot just going through this system, they were able to do a 100% inspection and ship parts out knowing every one of the parts they've got data collected on. And depending on what industry in you, that can be actually very critical from warranty replacement uh, or any type of warranty claim made against your customer from a part that was manufactured, you have data traceability all the way back to when this thing was cut by that or fed by that bar feeder. Akuma has the ability to trace that part from the bar feeder through the palletizer all the way out the door with barcoding. Yep. So the opportunity to improve your process and verify the quality that you're shipping is now capable and, and very easy to, uh, to attain. So one of the things that I'll highlight too is you can see the yellow caution on the floor. The two yellow poles, those are laser curtains. Uh, so if you cross that, it shuts that uh, robot down from a safety uh, fence standpoint. But a lot of the kitted robots that uh, we utilize, they do an area floor sensing uh, or area floor scanner. So that will, if an operator gets close, it'll slow the robot down. And then if it gets to within a certain range, it'll it'll stop it until the operator gets out of the system and hits a reset button. So you bring a very good point up, Wade. Gets into that. You bring up a good point from the perspective of a lot of people won't think of it. You look at that AWR, that is actually a robot being deployed in a collaborative application. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing, the form of collaboration that they're using is called speed and separation monitoring, utilizing that uh, area scanner to identify when a worker enters the robot zone. When it does that, the robot cuts its deceleration by 50%. It doesn't stop moving, but if the operator enters the actual working envelope, the robot will soft destop until that person or hazard is cleared from the zone. Yep. So this is another one, and I would encourage anybody that's got uh, you know keen interest on this that wants to see the video, please reach out to me. I can play it uh, separately when I'm not in this environment. But the interesting part on this is this is a super simple part. It's it's literally a tube and they're turning, they're centering, qualifying a surface and then turning an OD on a tube. And you would think, man, that would be hard to justify an automation uh, type process for something that simple. But in reality, the, the cost justification is fairly simple on it because of the um, manual intensive type work that was being done in this environment. All that was replaced with robots. And something I like about this cell, John, is the robots are mounted on pedestals inside the cell and the machines are outward facing. So the robots are reaching over the top and loading from the top through a moon roof in the top of the, the lathe, but the operator still has full access to the front of the machine. So it's very simple. If he needs to go in and uh, adjust an insert, for an example, or you know just check on something, very simple. He can uh, do do a, a, a halt basically to the system, open up the door, check everything and restart it and never has to enter inside that uh, automated environment. Yeah. So the thing is beautiful. The, the robots never stop working. So in a cell like this, um, we actually have a lot of technology. If you look at that robot in front of you on that first pedestal with the long arm, that's actually doing a 3D bin picking application. And if you can see that little piece of extruded aluminum running up the left side of the picture, unfortunately, the picture doesn't encompass the area scanner that's in there. 
So this dunnage, as it came into the customer's location, would be full of tubes, raw tubes. And then the tool on this was, you know, we take a picture of it so we can figure out, you know, what the top layer is. We have a, a grid that's projected on it so we can figure out the depth of that, that layer. And now we can take, I believe in these dunnages, there were nine layers of tubes that had to be taken out of that dunnage and then put on the conveyors. Now, if you think about that, we have to know exactly where that layer is because a robot that can generate, you know, thousands of pounds of force could damage these axle tubes and it could have been a problem. So we had to know exactly where they were. We used our 3D vision areas, so the 3D area scanner to identify where the location was and then we would go in and pick up the part. The goal on this is always 100% pickage of this tonnage. And we were able to, in, with Gossiker, we were able to ascertain and acquire 100% uh, dunnage pickage using a 3D area scanner. Excellent. A lot of technology in there. So John, I think we are coming right up on our time. I might've got a little bit long-winded, I apologize. But to, to wrap it all up, the main thing I want to get across is automation is proven technology. This isn't anything new. Um, there's no you know, black magic to it. It's all proven technology. It's been utilized globally. And it's a great way to look at how do you get better consistency in your process? How do you increase your spindle utilization? Um, every shop I've ever gone into, their automated cells are always the highest spindle utilization. Um, I talked to Milton Gary, uh, the, the president of Shunk here in America. Uh, I had an opportunity to, to go through his manufacturing floor here a while back. And that was one of the things that really stood out to me is he had one of our nine axis multifunction machines in an automated cell. And he was running about 85%, uh, might've been 88% spindle utilization on that cell. And that's a complicated machine doing a very complicated process. And by far, that was the highest uh, spindle utilization of everything else that he had running in the, in the plant. So um, if you have thought about automation years ago and you thought, ah, I don't have the right environment to be able to deploy it, or you know, I don't do enough production to justify it, take another look. If you never looked into it, hey, reach out to us. I'd love to talk to you guys and, and try to help you make that transition from uh, being a, a standalone manually loaded process to how do we get you into higher levels of technology and make you more efficient. So thank you guys for joining us. I, I put my email much. address and John, I put yours down there in the bottom too. So uh, feel free to reach out to us and I'll turn it back over to the folks at Modern Machine Shop. All right, thanks Wade and John. Uh, that was a really helpful presentation and you guys opened up a lot of uh, areas that we might wanna talk about. And over in the Q&A pane on the right side of your screen, we do have a couple questions that have come in um, and John, would you like to speak to uh, the question that you answered? I'm not sure if that's uh, visible to yeah, everybody. So, uh, David had asked how many machine tools are connected. I don't know exactly how many machine tools are connected because when there's Akuma, may, well, Akuma would know how many machines they have of their own specific machines um, connected. You know, from a machine monitoring perspective, there's a number of companies out there. You know, Wade had mentioned Rob Karen earlier. Um, there, there are numerous other ones out there that do a lot of machine monitoring. From a robot perspective, FANUC has a, a software package called ZDT, which is an acronym for zero downtime, where we monitor the health and uh, reliability of the, the entire robot itself, anything from reducers, drives, amps, um, even fans. There's a lot of different information we get. So currently globally, we have over 45,000 robots monitored through our ZDT product. Um, from the machine tool spot, maybe Wade, you can speak to how many Akuma, ro uh, Akuma machines are actually connected on the OSP platform. So what we see, and not just Okuma, just in, in general, machine tools in the North American market, um, it's in the single digits um, is, is information that we've seen um, here in the past. So um, it's becoming more popular, more people are, are connecting their machines, um, but it's, it's definitely been a little bit slower adoption. All right. And then I also wanted to jump to this question from Paul. What kind of additional skill sets does an operator need to implement machine tending? Uh, I think the most important one to me is uh, desire to do it, having the willingness to take on something new, something that's uh, different. If you're in a shop that's never done automation, any type of change is a is a break away from the status quo and that creates a little bit of chaos in the environment. So if you're somebody that's willing to say, hey, this is the right thing for us as a company and 
our future, having that willingness and desire to embrace the technology and bring it in, that's the most important part of it. Everything else can be taught. Um, being able to Im implement one of these like AWRs, load and goes, or um, even different types of custom application, um, you know, the, the skill set for that, having the, the programming uh, aspect, that's become a lot more simplified here recently. So, nope. <laughs> okay well on a on a similar note um i have another question here from your experience what are problems people run into after implementing automation um you know i think one environment or one aspect of it is um maintenance and making sure that they've really got their processes bulletproofed um, so maintaining the machine and having a proper preventative maintenance program and being able to monitor it and know when do you need to schedule that time to be able to properly mm. maintain that equipment and, uh, and take it offline to have proper maintenance done to keep it running. That's one of the most, most critical, uh, components of it. Um, and then again, uh, you know, I touched on it through the presentation, but that upfront process, I think a lot of people underestimate you know, how much they really have to do up front and checking tool paths, utilizing tools like uh, CG Tech's Vericut um, mm -hmm. or 3D VM, you know, being able to check the tool paths and work out clearance issues ahead of time long before it gets into that machine. Very good. All right. Well, I'm checking on our chat. And with that, um, I want to thank you guys. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us and everybody that's watching and participating here. Thank you. Uh, and that's all the time that we have for today's webinar. Uh, we hope that you found it valuable. And if you uh, want to view this again, you'll get an email that follows up this presentation uh, with a link to that recording. And that recording is also on our website, mmsonline.com. And with that, thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Thank you.